Hello and welcome to In the Light, Growing Your Soul with me, Anna Isabel. And today my guest is Jonas Atlas. And Jonas is here because I have found a very interesting read in his book, Religion, Reality Behind the Myths. Hello, Jonas. Hello, Anna Isabel. I, it is an, a very interesting book. And so I'm wondering what drove you to write this? What drove me to write this was basically talking about religion for a very, very long time. Um, on the one hand, it's my interest as a scholar in my work in the things I do, which have a lot to do with religion and multicultural living in society and so on and so on. But on the other hand, I'm just a believing person, let's say. I'm a God-focused person. And so all my life, ever since I was 16, I'm talking about religion and God to people. And then after a while, I figured out I always wound up in the same discussions. And one day it popped in my mind, well, really, I can bring them together in about seven bullet points and I should go through them one by one because they're all false and people in discussions have a tendency to jump from one aspect to the other and then back again and so it's things like oh religion doesn't mix with science or religions have created all the violence in the world so the, the typical talking points when it comes to religion and so that that was basically it uh, from the pubs to high school to in my job everywhere i encountered the same seven what i call myths about religion so i thought it's about time somebody uh, debunks those myths properly. Yes, and I think what's interesting here is that the myths that we're talking about are not religion as myth or the myths around religion, but they are the myths that abound in our society yeah. which decry religion. So I thought that was a very interesting perspective. So what do you feel are the the big myths around religion and that you just you just said it, it there's yeah. an incompatibility between science and and religion, and religion. that's one tell, yeah. tell us more. yeah yeah i'll go through the list of all seven of them the first one is is obvious that people think that religion is all about faith about things that you believe in and that those things are divinely ordained or something or written down in a book and then you believe them because you believe them you're obliged to follow certain rules and have a certain pattern of life so that's one belief and rules that are dictated by the religion then two is uh, the dictates come from a hierarchy religion is by definition institutionalized and the institutions determine what you should believe three is religions don't mix which flows from point one and point two that's to say if you're supposed to believe this and this and act like this and this because the priests in this religion tell you so then you never will mix with another religion i mean muslims believe in this christians believe in that uh, hindus do this and judas uh, jews do this but they will never do the same thing or something like that and then the fourth myth is the idea that spirituality and religion are different concepts which gives rise to about 25 percent of people in society calling themselves um spiritual but not religious so it's about the but the, the idea that i'm spiritual yes that's one thing but not religious so you can separate them out as if they're uh, separable entities then uh, science is not about uh, or religion and science don't mix very well and and are opposed by definition and then the sixth one is religions create most violence in the world. If you let re religions do their thing, then by definition it will end up in violence because they don't like what the others believe and the others do. And then the seventh, which kind of is the end result of all six of them, is that a secular society where religion is a bit pushed to the margins and is privatized in a certain sense or not in a certain sense but it's really privatized as something that you hold within your own head and heart but don't bring it into the public such a society is a lot better than a society where religion is the dominant uh, force in society um, yeah. And I think that we only need to look at our secular world falling apart in chaos to realize mm. that secularism is not the answer either. Not so, necessarily, no, indeed. So, 
there are some things there which some people would find surprising. So the mm. idea that a religion um, is not something that is uh, structured by an institution. Mm. Um, and, and there are other things in there that people might be surprised by as well. So what is your definition of religion? Oh, my definition. <laughs> That's, uh, where uh, in the book, uh, I, I take this for for the last thing to answer because I first have to go through those myths to to really explain it. But it's, it's a good idea to just bring it up front. And my my personal definition would be religions are psychological, existential, and spiritual languages, not with words and grammar, but languages with symbols, with myths, with stories with metaphors also with ideas and, and ways of uh, ritually expressing yourself to talk about the stuff that matters in life so religions are the sense and meaning making languages that we have because if you want to give meaning to something often the words themselves like in real language they're not enough you want to talk about something that transcends yourself that goes way deeper let's take something like soul you can only talk about soul in a metaphorical symbolic sense but for people who experience their soul it's the most important thing in the world of course and so to express those most important things that's why we have religions and express i mean not only with words but also in ritual and so on so um that's what i would call religion that's how i define it myself and i don't think a lot of people would take much offense with the definition in itself no. and I, I think that that is the definition that most people who refer to themselves as being spiritual would mm. also give to spirituality mm. it's just that they have for various reasons become disenchanted with the institutions that govern different religions yeah. so this is the 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 issue but it, it, it what you're saying right there is exactly mm. about our spiritual um existence mm. and you know what you're absolutely right this myth that religion causes wars people don't go to war because of religion mm. people go to war because of ideological political reasons uh, often to do with resort Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, definitely. We, we, and use religion as the excuse with, with which to do it and to manipulate uh, the population. See, that, that's an interesting yeah. one. Uh, and that's, I wouldn't put it that way. I understand what you mean, uh, but I wouldn't put it that way. And that's why it, it becomes handy to think of religion as a language. If you do so, then you can't really abuse a language. You're only going to use a language to say nice things to a person or to say awful things about a person. And it might not be very nice, but it's not abusing your language. If you say uh, really awful stuff about somebody, it's just awful to say it. And that is the same thing for religion for me. It's not that religions create the violence, but a lot of violence will be placed within a meaning-making language. And I say it very generally because that for me, and that's also why I use language, everything that we call a secular world also has this kind of language. So in a certain sense, but we can get later to that, a secular world is just as religious any, as any other religious world to me. But let's stick to religion and violence in itself. Is religion abused for the resources? No, I wouldn't say so in the sense that I do think that most wars are fought over resources and our political economic uh, events in history to start with, definitely so. But politicians will always have to attach a certain meaning to the whole thing to then get the people to really get enthused uh, to go and fight war. Because in the end, most wars only benefit the rich and the elite and so on. So you really have to convince people to fight those wars for you. That's not an easy feat. So you need this rousing language. And that's why language that offers meaning to life really becomes important. So it's not that religion is abused or something is simply used but again that would also be the case in what we call secular context just yeah, to give an example the war in iraq 
uh, which started in 2003 and which has still uh, which has its reverberations until today that war eventually yes it was about oil and, and and other stuff and politics and economics definitely it was about that but in the language of the politicians it was about bringing democracy and freedom and all those kinds of things that in a secular world would be the the metaphors and the symbols that they use to give meaning to what is a good life and we have to bring that good life to the rest of the world and again i wouldn't say that democracy is being abused it's just the language of democracy yes it's being used to fight uh, and to yeah. induce people to fight a war and, and that's exactly what i was getting at is that this is as you put it a language but that language is being used to manipulate people and the reason mm. that's possible is because this is a highly emotive language mm. too. Yeah. The people invest a great deal of emotion into what they believe because that's what gives their lives meaning. Mm. And so this is where we as human beings are vulnerable to manipulation because wherever our feelings are invested, that's where those who would manipulate will go. And so it's it's whipping people up. You, and I'm just thinking about the... Um, the wars in in the former Yugoslavia and how people of different religions had been living side by side perfectly harmoniously um, for the most part for so, so long. And suddenly it erupts into this vile hatred of the other. Um, so did you not notice that I was a different religion to you before? Well, you know, what's what's going on here? that is is what we're talking about is the the manipulation so i would never say that religion is the cause of war mm. um it's it's absolutely not the cause of conflict looking through history there have been many reasons but religion is the the means by which people are whipped up very often mm. yeah definitely yeah whipped up indeed it, it's often that language because you, you can find all sorts of things within the largeness of religious language within the many symbols that a tradition holds within itself over thousands of years you find both things you find the healing aspects and you find the divisive aspects you find the, the whipping up people in frenzies and you find the whipping up people in ecstasy which gives union with the divine all those things are there again just like in language you've got awful words or you can write uh, texts which are really uh, scientific or you can write texts which are poetry and the poetry like you say will bring you emotions or you can write texts that, that really uh, call people to do violence and so on that's the same thing with religion it's all there and you can express your deepest feelings and your emotive um, capacities in 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 that religious language so yeah it could go both ways i think too there's another factor here because we've talked about the institutions that govern the religions of the world mm -hmm. and become disenchanted with with many of them mm -hmm. but there's a factor here and that is that sometimes religions become a part of the culture too and sometimes you get the sense that certain things lose meaning and more and are more about custom than mm -hmm. they are about the original text mm -hmm. um, so that that's that's a, a very interesting one too it definitely is an interesting one and and for me that, that really fits the idea of looking at religion as a language half of the things that we say are habitual are patterns that we just uphold and that's the way we say things not because it's particularly nice or whatever but it's just it's, it's sayings the word itself there's lots of sayings that we use and it's the same in religion half of it is habitual but on the other hand i guess that's also because it gives meaning doing the things as the forefathers have done it is something that makes you feel at home in a certain place so in in a sense just taking over what people have done, whether it's in the old texts or not, um, is, is a normal thing for people to do. 
on the other hand, people will also always go back to the foundational texts and, and discuss them and find new meanings in them and use that same language that has always been used to tell a new story in every generation. So it's all there. Um, on the other hand, what you're saying is that sometimes uh, religion has a, or religious language have a tendency to ossify. I think that's true. Um, in, in many cases, it's definitely the case. It's definitely so that in religious communities, things have become so ingrained, so stuck within the pattern that people can't get out of it anymore. That's the way we say things and there's no other way of saying it can become really problematic. But then always you'll have some people on the margins um, saying, hey, 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 I checked the, the original text. That's not what it says. And then it just depends how, how, um, how well that voice is heard. And that brings me to the institutional aspect. That's indeed what a lot of people, and certainly those who say that they're spiritual but not religious, they react against the institutionalism of religion. The only problem there is that sociologically speaking, most religions aren't institutionalized. We're all thinking about Christian church, the Catholic church to start with, and then the various Protestant churches, but religion in itself has such a variety of dialects, let's say every religion, and most religions aren't structured like the Catholic church. It's really an exception in the religious world. There's no Pope in Islam. When you go to India and you try to find the core of Hinduism, well, try as hard as you might, you, you won't find it. There's a huge amount of communities which have some overlapping ideas, but one Hindu can believe something completely different than another Hindu and so on. So there's this shared language, as in we're talking about the same gods, but what that really means and implies for me in the world, in my own life, can be completely different. And so there, the whole idea of institutionalism, of course institutions can be problematic and can be suffocating and so on, certainly so. But that for me is again one of the problems of the myths, and that's why it's important to break them down. One thing that has happened in the last couple of hundred centuries is by creating religion as the boogeyman, as the one that is so problematic when it comes to institutionalized or being institutionalized, even though it's not really true in, in real life. But by acting as if that's the problem, we also um, can blind ourselves to the other forms in, of institution that dominate our life by now way more. Certainly so, the Catholic Church had too much to say in, in uh, a large part of, of history in, in of, of the West, of course, of the European West. But by now, that really isn't this big force in society anymore. But somehow, people are still railing against the institutionalized religion, while they're not seeing that their lives are being governed by institutions all the time work being one of them most people are working in highly hierarchical institutions whether it's i don't know a, a big company like meta facebook or whether it's uh, the the state the the simply some some government official within the state it's highly institutional and it's very hierarchical mostly in, in a company there's the ceo and the board of directors and they determine how you should live 40 hours a week or more and so on and so on but that doesn't get problematized because we're all like oh no no we're free we're free from religion now it's those others those others and the rest of the world who are still religious they have a problem because they're too uh, wound up in their hierarchies, but we, we're free of it. No, we're not. So I'm all in favor of dismantling problematic hierarchies. And I even think there should be a lot more debate about what the dynamics of hierarchy in our society are. But it really doesn't help us to act as if you've got religion there. And that's a dimension of uh, of society which has a problem with hierarchy and then you've got the secular space here and that one has has done away with the problems of hierarchy that really doesn't help us is if anything it blinds us to the reality that we're in right now it certainly does and i would say that the the biggest problem that we have in our society is hierarchy mm -hmm. uh, it and and it's it's um i think 
sorry, I've just had so many different thoughts there at once. And I was just thinking about how if if we stick to religion, how that birth of Protestantism was about getting out of that hierarchy of the of the church so that everyone was responsible for their own relationship with with God. Mm-hmm. And so you have that. And but we've transferred all of that into the secular institution. So we still have, we're still stuck in this mm-hmm. hierarchy mm-hmm. that is now basically wanting to tell us what to eat and what to do. All the stuff that <laughs> um, people object to with religion happening, but this time it's state secular secularism. And of course, we, we know that that's exactly what has happened in communist countries where, um, where the religion is all but been banned and the state takes over and is becomes the almighty God. Mm -hmm. So what do you feel is the, the value of having a rich spiritual slash religious life? What is the value of it for me personally? It's everything. I mean, that's why we exist um because we're made out of spiritual stuff and thinking about what the ground of being might be and how we relate to the ground of being seems to me the most important question to ask uh because it's again it's about sense making what the hell are we doing here on planet earth and the moment you ask that question you get into what people call philosophical debates but again basically those are religious because they are about the ground of being and we constantly bump up against those myths they're all over the place and philosophy and versus religion is another one of them don't really go deep into it into my in my book just on a side note but it's there as well people act as if those are two different things as if you had the philosophers like aristotle and plato and so on and those were rational thinkers and then along came the christians and they subdued those rational thinkers but they were so irrationally irrational in their faith well that's a complete distortion of of history to say but one thing there's lots to say about it but one thing that is very important is that people like aristotle and plato and so on were all thinking about what is the good life what is the ground of being how do we relate to that ground of being um how should we relate to that ground of being and basically they were all about self-development that's that's the term that we would use today how do i become more unified with that ground of being and how do i express myself uh, as a soul within uh, within existence in its fullest uh, capacity or something like that that's the type of stuff they were thinking about and talking about and if you read them really their texts it's the same like any other spiritual religious tradition that has always had that kind of discussion so all over history those uh, discussions have been had there I'm not saying there's one answer to it. There's a humongous amount of possible answers, and that's what makes religion so impressively interesting. But it's important to ask those questions. And again, within a world that calls itself secular, it's even more important to ask them because there has been this strange flip where society claims to be secular, and thus we don't have to deal with religion that's the stuff that you keep private but by doing that by 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 instituting this kind of dichotomy what you're basically saying is that one view of life is the norm and then all the others have to defend themselves for still being religious or something but what has become the norm eventually is um the basically what we call materialism of course The idea that God doesn't matter, God doesn't exist to start with. So no, no, there there is no meaning in life. But that in itself is a very meaning given, or not a meaning given. It, It says something about what you think is the meaning of life, namely that there is none. But that is a position, like the so many philosophical positions that you can take. But instead of 
acknowledging that you're just a position, you act as if you're by definition the most scientific, the most normal, the most uh, self-evident position. No, you're not. You have to, you have to argument why that would be a sensible position. Ninety percent of humanity, all through history didn't think that was a really sensible position and we can have a long debate about it but it's an important one to have and not one to brush aside and then act as if oh no we don't have to deal with that because the end result is if that's the point and there's nothing else in life except matter and it's a bunch of atoms just whirling around and uh, hitting each other and that's what we are there's not much meaning eh? to be found then within that kind of materialistic worldview then it becomes logical that the only thing you can possibly do is heap up as much matter as you can read become as rich as you can oh that that's handy for the powers that be in a capitalist system of course they like that kind of worldview the wonderful uh recipe for happiness it seems <laughs> um, <laughs> not um because you know the there is you know as a as a as a clinical hypnotherapist the i would say that everyone who comes to me comes to me because they are at a point of existential crisis mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter how much money people have in fact i would say that my wealthier clients suffer more from that because they have reached the holy grail of secular um, materialist view and they have discovered that it's empty. So this is the, the issue, isn't it? And, and I think also what you're describing there in terms of that materialist view, which has taken over the West, is leaving people suffering from depression and it, and it is being pushed in schools. It is being pushed in every aspect of society to the point where now Christmas is not supposed to be Christmas anymore. It's, it's a commercial exercise. And you can't even call it Christmas anymore. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's that. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that it, it's behaving like an orthodoxy, the kind of orthodoxy that many people shy away from when they're thinking about religion and particularly religious orthodoxy and yet here we are i think this mm -hmm. is just human nature and and we were talking about there about plato and and the uh ancient philosophers aristotle and so on they were wrestling with these very questions all you know, all through um the hermetic texts <laughs> full of full of these debates um, mm. as to what what God is, what is the, our relationship with God, what should our relationship with God be, where do we fit in the scheme of things? These are all perennial questions, mm -hmm. and we need to be able to answer them for ourselves in order to find our own path, our own meaningful path um, to our existence. Yeah, absolutely, and there's, there's a whole treasure trove there. Uh, and, and that's also... Um, I don't mind people calling themselves spiritual, but not religious, of course. But one thing that I, I, I do um, push up ag or push against is um, by calling yourself spiritual, but not religious, you, you kind of also, just like the secular world does, disband religion and act as if you don't need that anymore. And that I, I find the pity. It's a pity because the religious traditions or the hermetic tradition and, and call uh, and whatever tradition you can find out there, it's there's a treasure trove there of debates and of symbols and of rituals that can help you try to figure out how to talk about those questions and how to really deal with them. It's a bit like saying, uh, I, I'm I'm into poetry, but not into language. Uh, so I'm going to write my own poems, but I'm never going to look at what all the poets that came before me have ever written. Then I'm afraid your poetry won't be that very good. So, so we need to dare to delve into the, tra the traditions because they're really important. I, um, I think yeah. I'm a little bit more um, optimistic than you on that term of spirituality, because what mm -hmm. I've is that those who have become disillusioned with institutional 
religions or the institutions that govern religions mm -hmm. are very active in seeking other traditions that are more in line with their spiritual outlook on life and which do involve um, rituals that perhaps are more, more rooted in nature. Um, but nevertheless, this is where they, they find a, a home uh, mm -hmm. or a religious home as you, you would see it. So I think I'm a bit more optimistic yeah. than you on, on that. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic myself. I, I see lots of debates happening. Um, but but a, a bit like you said yourself, we have to watch out that we don't fall into the same trap that we're rightfully criticizing. If there's dogma, if dogma isn't what you want, then watch out for the dogmas that present yourself in, in different disguise or something. Because yes, the secular world has its dogmas and its, its orthodoxy. But the same thing I see happening within spiritual circles as well. And one of them sometimes seems to be that there's particular forms of traditions. Oh, you don't have to go there because that was all nonsense. That as well. Mm, no, I'm, I'm glad that people find them in whatever spiritual tradition they can find it. But stay open minded enough. I sometimes think when I meet some people, uh, stay open minded enough to also see the beauty in some other traditions where you didn't f at first think you would find them. So yes, this idea of, of uh, the dogma representing itself under a different form, I think that's a really important one. And, and that's also important for me, just to go back to what we have been discussing before. That for me, it's important that people realize that in today's world, when you talk about uh, people coming to your practice and they are in an existential crisis, um, it, often it is said, also in, in the texts of, of uh, well-known philosophers and so on, that because we got rid of religion, there is no meaning anymore in society. And that, uh, I don't believe that's true. I really don't think that the problem is that we have a society in which meaning has been removed from the equation. I actually think that we live in a society that has a very specific meaning making language. It's all there. It's just one that doesn't cut it anymore. People don't believe in it anymore. But this whole materialist philosophy, as we have been discussing, it's very clear about what the meaning of life is. Become as rich as you can. Don't think too much about certain other aspects that, that seem more woo-woo or spiritual to you and, and whatever. There's a very clear myth of the hero there of you have to grow, grow, grow and do your best and, and make it uh, and, 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 and become not only the most rich, but the most powerful, the most famous person. There's this clear myth of the hero there in loads of stories um which we all get spoon fed from the day we are born through disney uh movies and and loads of books and so on where we have this feeling that this self development but at infinitum not not since we don't believe in god no self development itself becomes this kind of ingrained dogma and then you get people who are constantly trying to get more and more and more and more and more and they get into this vicious circle of this one particular meaning that has been uh, that has been put at the forefront of of the the dominant worldview that drives our society for the most part. So there there's not only dogma there. There's a specific spiritual sense uh, or a sp spiritual flow that we have to recognize and. Lots of people indeed are getting existential crises, and I don't think that their problem is that they have a lack of meaning or a lack of spirituality in their seat. No, no, they, they bump up against the limits of the spirituality and the meaning making that has been given to them. So they have a crisis of faith, just like Luther had in the Catholic Church or like the Buddha had in his day or like Jesus had with his religious elite around them. So they, those are people that, that stood up against the suffocating uh, religious context of their day. And I think we actually have to do the same thing. We're, we're getting against or we're bumping against the limits of the existing paradigm. 
and it's not empty. There is a specific message there. There's a specific story and we have to rethink it's, the story. It's chasing. It's just chasing something that is not meaningful mm. anymore. And I think that's the, the key here. It's this, maybe it's about putting your faith in the wrong myth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, um, as, as you say, you know, the, the myth of the hero um, or maybe what we're talking about is a situation where the myth of the hero has now been misinterpreted and the original meaning lost. Mm -hmm. And listening to you also, I was thinking about how there is a narcissistic element to this, where if all we become concerned with is self-development, then that becomes a narcissistic tendency. And really what, what religions have always been about has been about the individual connecting with community and the community also then connecting with God. So it, it, the thing that religions I feel were successful at was the idea of collective worship or collective meaning, which is why so many cultures are based around them and tradition comes from it. And I, it's, it's that connection with other people that's missing then. And I, we are suffering from, um, I would say, an epidemic of isolationism mm. in our societies. And the reason that is, is because we have be been told that we don't exist in the context. Mm. And it's, we look at the individual, but we don't look at the individual in the context of family, in the context of culture, in the context of society. And that may well be breeding some very narcissistic tendencies and, and separating people from each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. There's a, this myopic view of the individual as nothing but an individual and self-contained and not being, by definition, uh, a nucleus of a network. And we're all a nucleus of a network. Um, uh, in a sense, there, there's this beautiful definition of God that pops up uh, every hundred years again uh, in the text. And it's God is a globe of which the circumference is nowhere and the center is everywhere. But I think you could say the same thing about humanity. We're all humans in this web of things and the circumference is nowhere, but the, the center is everywhere within our deepest cells as well. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's definitely true. The myopic view of uh, the individual, which is part of the myth of the hero for me. And indeed, like you say, it's a it's a distorted view of the myth of the hero. Because in, in the traditions, if you really delve into them and you look at the myths of the hero, oftentimes half of, or there is this myth of the hero and he does well and he, he's victorious and so on. And then comes the fall half of the time. Uh, Icarus is the most famous example, of course. He and his father have to flee the Minotaur and they defeat him and then they fly out and they're all happy because, oh, look at how scientific my dad was. He invented wings and we can now fly. But the young Icarus and all his hubris, he flies too high and he gets too close to the sun and his uh, the glue starts melting and he falls into the sea and he's dead. And so, yes, there's a myth of the hero, but in traditional a religious context there will always be this but beware don't get too hubristic don't get too narcissistic you're just a small part in a larger whole and so on and so on and so the the emphasis on on humility is is normally there but in the myth of the hero of, of contemporary society it's it's nothing but this guy's the limit and, and it doesn't stop and that by definition isn't true of course because well we're we're uh we're limited beings, let's say. And if there is an unlimited within us, it's not because we ourselves are unlimited, but because we're connected to an unlimited whole, which I, of course, would call God. Well, Jonas, that is um, a, a lot for people to think about. And I think I might end it with the, the warning, beware of dogma. Mm -hmm. And... And just to tie it all together, humility may be the thing that helps us to beware of dogma. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for your time today. A reminder Welcome. to everyone that the book that we have been discussing is Religion, 
reality behind the myths. And I'll be putting a link to that in the description box. And if people want to find you, Jonas, and learn more about your work, how do they do that? Oh, www.jonasatlas.net. And my uh, my own podcast series is uh, Revisioning Religion. Wonderful. And where is that on Spotify? Oh, yeah, everywhere on the all the channels, iTunes and so on. Okay. Well, I will be putting a link to those um, in the description box. Thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. You're welcome. It was a lovely conversation. Thank you very much. And thank you all for watching. Now, next time, we're going to be exploring the supernatural. Until then, goodbye.